Hey, what's everybody? Welcome to episode 112 of the Former Action Guys podcast. I'm your host, Justin Kramer. This week I have on former Army Ranger and uh, Special Forces soldier Jack Murphy. He uh, previously worked at 3rd Ranger Battalion as a sniper uh, and a team leader, and he was also with 5th Special Forces Group as a weapon sergeant on a military freefall team. Did uh, multiple deployments. He's uh, got out of the military, decided to go to Columbia University, became a journalist. Uh, he's started multiple podcasts. He's written multiple books, including his memoir, Murphy's Law. Um, you can see his his podcast is the Team House, available basically everywhere podcasts are available. They also do live streams Friday night. He's the co-host, actually him and his uh, friend and Army Ranger Dave Park uh, co-host that together really good interview with them um it's always interesting to have like army guys come on and talk because you know we do a lot of the same stuff but there's those little differences and things and um just hearing different perspectives and stuff like that especially from somebody that was in the socom community and working during the global war on terrorism and the time frame you're, you're talking his deployments happened between like 2004 2007 time frame and so that was an interesting time to be in that community so i think it's a really great interview i hope people enjoy it um Thanks to whoever threw in another uh, review on Apple Podcasts. That put me up to 115. I'd, I'd say thank you to the person specifically, but they didn't write a written review. That's fine. I appreciate the review nonetheless. Uh, also, as always, make sure to tell one of your friends about the show. Check out my website, jkramergraphics.com. Subscribe on all the channels. You know I'm everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. I'm all over the place. And, um, yeah, that's it. Enjoy the show. Today on the Former Action Guys podcast, I have Jack Murphy. Really excited to have you on today. Uh, who's Jack Murphy? He's an investigative journalist who's reported from Iraq, Syria, and other countries around the world. He's authored his memoir, which is Murphy's Law, and multiple fiction books uh, like Reflexive Fire, Gray Matter Splatter, and others. He's uh, also an Army Ranger that served as a sniper and a team leader in 3rd Ranger Battalion. Uh, left the Rangers, went to... Q course and entered the uh, special forces senior weapon sergeant and on a military freefall team with fifth special forces group. And now the co-host of the team house podcast podcast with uh, fellow army ranger, Dave park. Again, man, like I said, before we got started, I really appreciate you coming on. I've been a big fan for a long time and I don't have enough army guys on this, uh, uh on the podcast. Um, so it's good to get a different perspective of kind of how the whole, you know, G Watt career was like for you. Hey man, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. So I'd like to start out, you know, you've said before and you've written that you were going out of high school, you're going to join the French Foreign Legion. You had considered doing that. What before we get into your army career, what kind of made you think that that would be a good idea? Like, what was your kind of thought process into considering that as an option? Well, remember, I graduated high school in 2002. So as I was coming up as a teenager, I America was in, you know, quote unquote, peacetime. There's really not much happening. There was, you know, Bosnia and, uh, and deployments to the Balkans, but there wasn't any real war to fight. Uh, and in my uh, teenage brain, I thought that joining the French Foreign Legion would probably be the surest bet to actually see some action, do some deployments to Africa or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, 9-11 uh, happened my senior year of high school. Um, so it all... Uh, kind of made sense for me to <laughs> join the U S military. So for you was the military like going to the, so it sounds like you wanted to get into combat, not necessarily go like serve your country. Was it, was that kind of the idea? I, I mean, I wanted to serve my country, but no, you're not wrong either that I wanted to, I wanted to experience war. I wanted to see combat. Yeah. And um, if I couldn't find that in the United States military, you know, I'd go looking for it and, you know, I guess the French military in this case. Yeah, for sure. And that's a, you know, it's a, it's strange. I've actually met people that have gone and tried to go through the French foreign legion or really considered it because of the different options. I was actually looking at it the other day cause I hadn't read about it in a while. I was looking at the different, what you have to do, you just show up. And then if they take you, they take you and you know, you start the process and stuff. It's really interesting. Um, anyway, so you go into the army. What made you decide the army over any other branch? Uh, well, I, honestly, I first went to the Marine Corps and uh, I told them, sign me up. I want to be infantry. Really? And yeah, yeah. And the recruiter actually kind of blew it. Now that I look back on it, I he uh, he told me I have 24 hours. He's like, you go go home. Think about it. If you decide you still want to do this, you come back tomorrow morning. You sign the contract. He's like, I can get you infantry right now. The day after I can't get you infantry. All those slots are taken. Mm -hmm. So. 
take it now or, or, or just, or, or, you know, you have to sign now or never basically was, was kind of the ultimatum he was giving me. And, uh, it just felt like he was selling me a used car at that point. Yeah. So I, uh, I went down the hall and talked to the army, um, which is kind of, it was kind of weird. I mean, I was totally ready to sign up. And then that guy kind of, uh, he tried to give me the hard sell, which was totally unnecessary because I, I, I was already prepared to buy, uh, yeah. So I, I don't understand why he used that tactic, but it, it kind of turned me off. So yeah, I went and talked to the army instead. That is kind of strange. You know, interesting though, in that time frame and up until the plus up in the Marine Corps, going infantry was actually extremely hard to do. You know, if you went and talked to him, he may have been right. Like, hey, I have it right now. Like I have this quota now, but tomorrow I'm not going to have it. I mean, it. I I personally went down and wanted to go infantry and they told me like, hey man, you can't get it now, but you know, we'll see if we can work it in because they have the quotas. And I know multiple guys that just couldn't get it. I ended up going open contract like an idiot, you know, even worse. And I uh, became a mechanic for a little while before I became a 0861 and stuff. But it is what it is. You know, was infantry all that you would do? Is that all you were set on? Um, well, again, infantry was sort of the, uh, the gateway into special operations as yeah. well. And the Marine yeah. Corps, that was sort of the gateway into Marine recon, force recon. Mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. is all before MARSOC, of course. For sure. For sure. Um, in the Army, there's a much clearer pathway, actually, right into special operations, getting a Ranger contract uh, and going to RIP, um, which that, that pathway still exists to this day. Um, so, I mean, it ended up working out and being a good thing in that sense. Can you kind of explain that process for people that may not be aware? I know it's probably changed a little bit since you went through, but the contracting end of Ranger, do you go straight to boot camp and then right into RASP or RIP or whichever one it is, and then that follow-on training? Pretty much, yeah. You go to your basic training, and for me it was uh, OSIT, so it's your basic training and your infantry training together uh, for, I believe, 11 weeks. And then because you're on a Ranger contract, all Rangers are airborne. You go to three weeks of airborne school uh, right there at Fort Benning. And then you go down the road to uh, what was at that time called the Ranger Indoctrination Program, RIP, which is three weeks long. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now now it's much bigger. It's uh, much more thorough. Guys receive much more training. It's called RASP, Ranger Assessment and Selection Program. I believe it's eight weeks long. Um, so guys are coming out of that much better prepared for life in Ranger Regiment. Um, but that, that's still essentially the pipeline, your basic training, uh, airborne school, and then Ranger indoctrination or Ranger assessment and selection. Are you guys segregated at all in boot camp, or are like all the Ranger contracts one way, or are you guys just mixed in with everyone? Is that a thing that they pick on you about and stuff like that? They, they did tend to lump us all together. Like my, if I remember correctly, everyone in my basic training platoon, we were all going to rip or I think 82nd or 101st. Like they were, they were airborne units that these guys were heading to. Yeah. Um, so they yeah. did kind of lump us together, but of course there are many different MOSs in the Ranger regiment. So not everyone of course is going to infantry basic training. They're going to become board observers, medics, commo guys, RTOs, whatever the case may be. So, of course, those guys are going to their own basic training and AIP and then airborne. And then they're, and then everyone's kind of coming together and going through RIP or RASP together. Interesting. I didn't. So, but they signed up under a Ranger contract as well. Correct. Yeah. So they would be like a forward mm. observer, but they would have the option 40 Ranger contract. So they're going, there are different MOS, but going through the same pipeline. Gotcha. See, I did. I thought, see, there, there you go. You learn something new every day. I thought that if you signed up for the Ranger contract, it was like all the infantry skills all the way up and then going through. That's interesting. I thought, you know, like enablers. I don't know how it works with the Ranger battalion. I guess like your enablers are part of the battalion and they go through all the training. They're not just attachments. I, when, again, back in the day, everyone went through RIP. Or if you were an officer or an NCO, you went through ROPE. Um, they still have that. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. also... Uh, so it's RASP 1 and RASP 2. So NCOs and officers are going through RASP 2. They have this, it's the same idea, but they've greatly upgraded these selection courses. Um, so, yeah, everyone's going through some sort of uh, assessment and selection process. For you, what was the hardest part of this assessment and selection for, for Ranger Battalion? And what would you do differently to like prepare for that? Honestly, what kicked my ass was the ruck marching. Uh, they had us in, you know, we do like forced marches and, and it's nothing high speed or anything per se. I mean, it's like standard weight, weighted rucksack, 12 miles. Um, 
And uh, not to make bullshit excuses for myself, but here's a bullshit <laughs> excuse. Uh, I, I got sick. I, I mean, I did. My, my lung had a bunch of fluid in it. And um, I kept I failed out of the road march. And then because I got sicker and sicker, I failed that I flunked out of the retest also. So I had to recycle rip and, and get on antibiotics for like five days and then start the course again on Monday and um, and start all over again. So that, that was just very difficult. It was very frustrating because it's like, you know, you should be able to do this physically. Mm -hmm but your body won't allow you to do it because you're sick. <laughs> so it was, it was very frustrating. But um, overall, I'd say it was a very good course. If I was to do something differently, looking back on uh, a lot of my military training, I was always a runner. Um, I did a lot of cardio. I did a lot of um, long, long range um, endurance runs and things mm -hmm. like that. Looking back on I probably should have integrated a lot more strength training or a lot more weight training. Um, but the range of regiment itself, I think the culture has also changed uh, from it was it, back in the day. It was a lot of running, a lot of ruck marching, a lot of pull ups, uh, push up, all that kind of stuff. Dips on the dip bar. Now they're much more into the m more modernized, like functional fitness, um, doing deadlifts and, and all sorts of uh, strength training like that. So I think the regiment itself has also evolved and gotten much better and much smarter about how they train. Yeah, that's awesome. I, something I've seen, and as I was getting out, even the Marine Corps as a whole, you know, I think the military as a whole is starting to realize, like, hey, just beating your body up and, and working on minimal yeah. sleep over and over and over again, you know, is only effective for a little bit. And look how much more effective we could be if we actually teach guys, you know. It's funny, and I'm sure you've seen it too, the amount of, like, supplements and bullshit that dudes will put into their bodies, you know, to try to, like, stay ready for whatever missions or whatever they got going coming up. And it's like, dude, this is – a very unhealthy way of living and it's good that it's kind of changed a little bit the culture's changing a little bit yeah yeah i think so too um you know again as much as i was a long distance runner i mean just doing those sorts of endurance exercises is, is not 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 necessarily healthy for a, a lot of guys mm -hmm. um a lot of stress fractures and injuries and things yeah. like that um do, just doing like uh really heavy ruck marches and ruck runs all the time. It, like it, it's that point of diminishing returns that maybe you use some of that stuff in selection, but you want to have a soldier, a ranger or operator, whoever it is, um, be durable enough to have a 20 year career in the military. And uh, some of those old ways of training are yeah, kind of obsolete. It, like you said, it seems like they've gotten a lot smarter about it. Yeah, for sure. Especially when you look at the amount of money that's put into some of these like MOSs to get the proper training and stuff. It's it does no good to train a guy. You spend a million dollars literally to train a guy and then turn around and put him on the bench because now he's beat up. You know, um, yeah. that's got to be one of the hardest things ever to be recycled in a school and being like, fuck, now I got to start over again. Here we go. It's a character building experience. That's the way you have to look at it. Character building experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think dealing with uh, failure as a young man is a good thing. You know, it, it teaches you to you know you got to man up sometimes. You got to suck it up and and the, and also the the military, the army. I mean, it's pretty good about giving you a second chance to recycle or retest. Um, you know, you, you apply yourself, figure out what you're doing wrong, and mm -hmm. try to correct it. And, and they they give you opportunities to correct yourself. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So once you finished up like Ranger, once you finished up the assessment and selection portion of it, and you you know you're getting ready to go to the unit, or maybe you're already at the unit. Does that when your actual like school pipeline starts, or do you just kind of go to schools when you can, and you just integrate with the unit and whatever training cycle they're in? Uh, well, when you show up at the unit is when you show up at the unit. Uh, and as you said, you, you kind of just cover down on whatever that training cycle is, wherever they are at in it. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the traditional uh, there may be other schools that you have to go to here and there. But I mean, really, the, the school that everyone's focused on when you finish uh, RIP or now RASP is you're waiting to go to Ranger School and you want to go to Ranger School as quickly as possible. Because until then, you're basically, I mean, you are a forever private, essentially, in oh, Ranger. Really? Yeah, yeah. And in order to hold any sort of leadership position to move up the ranks at all, you're going to have to graduate from Ranger school as well. So everyone who is a, uh, a, a private in Ranger battalion is kind of fighting to get to Ranger school <laughs> as quickly as possible. That's interesting because I, I was one of my questions was going to be, you know, if that was even a priority going to ranger school, because I know there's like a difference, you know, and some people don't understand there's a difference between ranger battalion and going to ranger school and that it's a leadership school that 
anybody in the army can go to. And, and even in the Marine Corps, you know, we send guys to it and stuff like that. So that's pretty interesting that you have to do that to even move up. What kind of, it probably helps too, to go to it right after you get done with your assessment selection. You're probably in the best shape you could be in to go do something like that. Um, yeah, yes and no. Um, you're right. You're in good shape. You're going to be kept in shape as a, as a young ranger, regardless. Yeah. They, they're uh, they're going to PT you pretty hard. Um, but ranger school, uh, is, you know, focusing on small unit tactics, uh, filling those squad leader and platoon sergeant PL positions and learning how to do that job. Uh, as a young PFC and Ranger Battalion, you don't necessarily have the benefit of um, knowing, having any pre-existing knowledge before you go to Ranger School because you've never you've never done the job. You've never seen it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've never seen your leadership do that job before. So you don't necessarily understand it. And um, I, I can speak to this firsthand because I did get sent to ranger school very quickly. Um, and it, there were good things and bad things about it. And, you know, the bad thing was I had no idea what I was doing. I was, I was completely lost. Um, I was probably the youngest uh, person there with no idea what was going on. Um, but on the positive, it was a good learning experience, right? Yeah, for sure. The culture shock continues, you know. And that's a, yeah. an interesting point you bring up and something I tried to remind guys while I was in and coming up you know, as they'd be like harassing the junior guys, like, Hey man, they don't know what they don't know. You know, you're expecting them to do these tasks that you've been practicing for like a year or two years or many years, but they, they've never even been introduced to the concept. You you know, you can't expect them to be masters of it right off the bat. You know, that's definitely something I think a lot of people forget, you know, as they uh, come up in the military and stuff. So let's talk about when you get to Ranger Battalion, what is that culture like? You know, is it what, you know, I mean, I guess just, I won't even try to guess. You want to just explain like, what's it like to check into the unit? Are you super nervous? Are you ready to go? I'm, I'm sure they're really welcoming, you know, when you get to the barracks and stuff. All, all, all of the above. Um, it's super competitive. You're always under the microscope. Uh, you're drinking from the fire hose. Um, and what I, what I mean by that is everything in Ranger Battalion is a competition. Uh, you're competing with all the other privates in your squad, in your platoon, in your company. Um, Everything is very comp- whether it's climbing a rope, who can climb the rope the fastest, who can run to the chow hall the fastest, uh, who can you know tie their boot laces. The- like every single thing becomes a competition. Um, drinking from the fire hose, I just mean the amount of knowledge that's being uh, thrust upon you. Uh, mm-hmm. th- you know, for good reason. They're trying to teach you. They're engaging. Like we were talking, you were talking about a moment ago, the coaching, teaching, mentoring that has to take place with new soldiers to get them up to speed. Um, so it can be your team leader. Uh, it can even just be a, you know, a quote unquote senior private in the squad who's taking you aside saying, you know how these night vision goggles work? No. Okay. Put them on. I'm going to show you how they work. Take mm-hmm. your hand, put them here. This is your focus knob. This is how you focus, you know, all the way um, through, you know, uh, tactics, uh, how to, the correct employment of machine guns, uh, how we run gun trucks, uh, all of the, all these little things, uh, I shouldn't say little things, but all these specific unit specific tactic techni- techniques and procedures, uh, that a new ranger has to learn. Um, so you're really drinking from a fire hose and you're under a microscope because your entire, uh, leadership is just looking at you. Like they're looking at you for signs of weakness. You're in the shark tank yeah. every day. Um, and they want to see you perform. And they're, they're looking at you, see who, who are my weak links, who are my strong links, where do you fit in? Um, so that that's kind of the environment. Um, it's also, uh, at least back when I was in, it was, it was very much a, uh, a work hard, play hard kind of environment. Um, by the time you get to Friday night, uh, it wasn't uncommon for there to just be smashed beer bottles all up and down the hallways of the barracks. Um, guys doing keg stands and all, just all kinds of wild Lord of the Rings or Lord of the Flies. <laughs> type stuff going on in the, uh, in the barracks on a weekend. That's crazy. That's a, just to imagine something like that, you know, that would not happen in the Marine barracks. They would, uh, murder. I, you know, one time we had a keg stand or we had a keg, uh, in 29 palms after a big exercise. And we in, the company commander was doing a keg stand and we had somebody from tanks battalion was next door and they were mad that we were all having like a party. And they came over and said, someone was throwing rocks at their, we were in these open squad bays Someone threw rocks at their windows or something. They're like, where's your company commander? And he like just popped off the keg. We're like, hey, he's right there. He just got off the keg stand. So it was a good time. That's not, that's pretty rare 
thing to see though. Um, you know, that work hard, play hard environment is important though, because you got to be able to blow off some steam. You can't be balls to the wall constantly. And like, and, and what are you going to do with a bunch of like super, you know, testosterone filled 18 to 20 something year olds that they have to have that, that, that ability to blow off that steam. You know, that's nothing wrong with that. It's funny how you talk about like the, you know, the, crazy amount of information a lot of times you hear like jobs like that it's like jumping on you know grab on to the train as it goes by and now you're riding and then at some point you got to jump off you know but while you're on it it's just all that stuff coming at you um yeah what was the hardest part for you to like integrate into the battalion i mean you say it was like going into the shark tank was it like you eat your own you know where people like this dude is slower fuck him kind of deal or was it you guys are all trying to be competitive but you're building each other up you're all competitive. Uh, your your leadership and your team leaders, squad leader, uh, they will teach you the standards. They will try to bring you up to the standard. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also mm-hmm. up to you to keep your head above the water. Yeah, for sure. And if, if you can't do that and you can't perform, then you're going to start running into problems. Um, and this is what you know uh, is referred to as RFS or release for standards which the Ranger Regiment will do. If I'm, you can't perform, they're going to show you the door. Mm-hmm. Um, so they will teach you your job. You will have opportunities to learn. Um, you'll have opportunities to screw up and fix yourself. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you can't pull your weight, I mean, sooner or later, they're, they're going to you know, uh, <laughs> lose interest. Yeah, in, for in, sure. And trying to drag a dead weight with them. Um, yeah. and, I, and I've seen it for sure. You know, you have to though, in a job, in a job field or, or, you know, a unit like that, where the, the mission is as serious as it is, you know, lives are literally on the line. You can't like keep some guy here just because he's a nice dude. It's like, Hey man, yep. if you can't, if you can't perform, you can't perform. Like if you're dangerous in these situations, if you make the situation more dangerous, then you're no good. And it's tough sometimes because, you know, I've seen it in the JTAC world, you know, it's a high stress job. And it's like, dude, if you can't perform, man. I like you, you know, you're a good person, but you're just not the dude for this job. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Yeah. It's nothing personal. It really isn't. And, um, especially the, the timeframe we're talking about, a lot of guys are getting to their unit and they're going right into combat. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, it's not like the past where maybe you had plenty of time to train up, go to ranger school, get your ranger tab, you know, do some JRX or some, uh, some other training rotations, Mm -hmm. uh, and PC and so forth. Like, no, like you can get to your unit and be deployed the next day. Literally. Yeah. I've definitely actually had a kid uh, on my deployment, uh, with three, six in 2011, who was like, I think he was in the fleet for about two weeks and then he was out, you know, PFC or I think he was a private still actually, you know, it's pretty crazy. It does happen though. When you, when you showed up, you were probably there. I mean, when you're getting to Ranger Battalion, all those guys at Ranger Battalion are probably new combat vets, right? Like they're just getting through the initial rotations. What was that yeah. like being underneath, you know, being taught the, from these guys who now went and took all those theories that they've been learning and put it to practice and came back with some lessons learned. That, that's a very interesting topic. I, I think, um, it, it was great in the sense that all of the people I worked under were combat veterans. Mm-hmm. Like these mm-hmm. guys were the real deal. This is the nine 11, uh, generation of Rangers. These guys jumped into Afghanistan, jumped into Iraq. I mean, when I got there, it was right after OIF one, these guys had just participated in the invasion of Iraq and there I'm showing up new guy like, Oh my God. And, yeah. uh, and all of these guys are combat vets, so I got to learn from them. I got to hear about their experiences and learn from them um, and learn about what I was going to head into myself. Um, Ranger Battalion at this time was very much in a, a sort of transitory state. It was in this like transition it was going through from the old Ranger Battalion, where it's much more spit and polished. They were the standard bearers for the U.S. Army. Uh, with spit shined boots and their, uh, you know, starched and, and pressed BDUs and everything. Um, and, and really doing a lot of like um, uh, dismounted uh, patrols, patrolling through the wood line, doing like platoon level patrol bases out in the woods and stuff like that. Now Ranger Battalion is transitioning from that model of being a, a sort of airborne elite airborne light infantry unit to being a modern day counter terrorism unit mm-hmm. uh, fighting in the Middle East, largely in urban areas. Um, and so like when I got there, just something I thought was interesting was 
it was really important for my team leader that I got my LCE, my old school, like Vietnam era web gear and like taped it all up and had all the tie down standards with the 550 cord and burned the ends and <laughs> it's all done to the standard, the blue book standard. There's literally a blue book that has the standards in it that the right way to do all of this. So I get it all done up and then that goes into the wall locker and I never touched it again. And we used, uh, you know, the more modern like body armor and web gear and everything that that was being issued at the time. So it's interesting how there are like these two worlds and yeah. we're moving one to the other. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the sergeant major kind of world into like the, Dude. you know, the when you're at. <laughs> oh, we, we, we abandoned the high and tight a few years later. And that, that led to no end of uh, consternation with. Uh, some of the senior enlisted Rangers. I'm sure you got calls from like old Rangers, like what's going on in my Ranger battalion? What's going on over there? It's so funny. You mentioned that because it, that did happen. I remember when I was on CQ, I, uh, I must've been a, yeah, I was a private uh, still. I was very new. I'd only been in the battalion for like maybe a month. And I got a phone call from uh, one of the old timers and he started, he started chewing my ass, chewing my ass because we were all fucked up. He's like, go. <laughs> are all fucked up you've been all fucked up ever since you moved into those new barracks like yeah he he, he hold me hold me rick me over the coals for like half an hour i couldn't believe it you're like geez man go on that's what facebook's for you're supposed to go on there and voice <laughs> those concerns this is before that <laughs> yeah that's right i'm dating myself but yeah had that myspace had that profile MySpace. going <laughs> man yeah so can you talk about what what was like the workups at that time? If you if you know you're going on these deployments, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you guys would go on deployments, they were normally like three to four months, right? They're obviously not like big army where they're going for a year long. Luckily, the Marine Corps only does seven month deployments unless you're with one of the higher commands. Was was your guys shorter to three or four? Yeah, yeah, they were three month deployments. Um, the workup to them, uh, I miss. So I missed the first deployment I would have gone on because they, they sent my ass off to Ranger school. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came back, uh, I was in sniper section. We did our own, uh, being in sniper section is different. You're doing your own kind of uh, training, um, sniper specific training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, then when I, when I deployed as a gun team leader uh, in 2005, uh, our, our pre-mission pre -mission training was actually very good um, and very much calibrated to um, going and fighting a sort of counterterrorism uh, campaign in uh, in an urban environment. Um, and I don't know what direction you want to take with all that to talk about, um, but we can get into that deeper. No, I'd love to talk about, you know, what were you what were you guys doing? And did you feel like the training, you know, you just said it was good training for that. Were you were you doing direct action raids and were they like helo born vehicle raids? Were you guys on foot doing patrols? Like what did that deployment kind of look like and was your training you know good enough to get you ready for that uh which one the first one in afghanistan or the second well, let's go we'll go for the first one we'll start you know going order okay. so you said um, the first one you were with the sniper team right yeah so, yeah did you go through a specific school is there a ranger specific sniper school or did you go to the big army sniper school i don't know how that works I uh, went to the big army sniper school. There's also uh, the special forces sniper course, which is called, uh, it was called SODIC at the time. Um, I didn't go to that one. I went to the the um, one at Fort Benning. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, came back from ranger school, got asked if I wanted to go to sniper section, went over there, um, did the Fort Benning sniper course and came back. And we, we did some like range training and stuff like that to get prepared for, uh, for that deployment. And um and then, yeah, deployed to Afghanistan. I was attached to Charlie Company in 2004, uh, also with the new Recce group, the uh, Recce platoon that had just been stood up at the battalion level. Um, so we were in Kaust province 2004 into 2005. And um, a combination of, uh, well, I mean, they were more. Um, ground convoys. We we're doing a ground assault force, okay. uh, hitting different different objectives out there in Afghanistan and that surrounding area. Um, a little bit of like checkpoint uh, stuff down on the down on the border with Pakistan. Also, uh, did some aerial platform support as a sniper. I'm um, flying around in helicopters to support the guys on the ground, uh, and then some recce work also. Okay, so what one of those missions did you like doing the most? Like, well, if you had a preferred mission, which one would it be? Oh my gosh. Um, 
So, you know, I think the one that stands out in my mind is like the cool factor was doing aerial platform support from uh, Little Birds. Yeah. And uh, again, another one of those moments where you're drinking from a fire hose. I'm like, what, 21? I, you know, I'm a, you know, sniper and all this good stuff, but relatively inexperienced. This is my mm -hmm. first deployment. And uh, I remember talking to my sniper uh, uh, partner, my team leader at the time, who's a great, great guy um, and an amazing shot. I think he won the international sniper competition twice. Oh, wow. Uh, and he, yeah, he had been to that Benning sniper course. He had been to Sodic and he had been to the Marine Corps scout sniper course. Nice. So like this nice. guy, he knew his stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I'm asking him because I'd never done an aerial platform shoot before. And I, I said, Hey man, um, how does this work? Is there anything I should know? And he was like, Oh yeah, it's easy. Don't worry about it. He's like, so you know that, uh, when you shoot a moving target, right? You shoot ahead of the target because there's a, the bullet has a certain amount of time and flight. Mm -hmm. So you're shooting a little bit ahead of the target so that by the time he walks, you know, he intersects with your bullet, um, and hits him. So you got to lead, you have to lead the target, right? I'm like, yeah, I got, yeah, of course I, I know what you're talking about. He's like, well, in this case, you're moving because you're in the helicopter. So you have to fire behind the target so that the bullet walks into him. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what? Wait, my, my mind just exploded here. Um, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> we did some training on it. Um, we got to do uh, a run out at the range with the little bird pilots. Nice. And, th and then the next night we went and did the operation. And um, that definitely, you know, the cool factor was pretty high. That, that was, uh, you know, the, being in the military isn't anything like in the movies, as you know. Yeah. But it was one of those mo that was one of those moments where I watched um, my sniper partner, Joe. He was on the other little bird. And at one point they saw people down in the compound like, coming out at night like they like we didn't know if they're going to try to make a run for it or what and i see his little bird just do like a dive bomber run and then the pilot like you know uh pulls up mm -hmm. at the very last moment and just the rotor wash just blows all through the inside of this compound and the guy runs back inside and they lift out and buzz over in the other direction yeah it looked at watching it under night vision it looked like something out of a movie it's got to be you know it's got to be yeah. those little bird <laughs> pilots are wild man I've seen, I've seen yeah. them on the range and stuff. I, I didn't work with them overseas at all, but just, and actually sitting in the, the helicopter, it's funny how basic that helicopter is, how like, it's just nothing, you know, but they're very, I don't know. Those dudes are snipers with that grease mark on their, on their windshield. It's pretty funny. Um, yeah. yeah. What kind of, what kind of rifle are you using when you're doing like an aerial platform shoot like that? Uh, I was using an SR 25 okay. at the time. Um, we also had a 300 wind mag, uh, which was brand new to the unit. Hmm. Uh, but, but I was using the SR, um, on that deployment. Okay. And, um, a lot of times what it seems like, and what I've read, it seems like that the, the Rangers are going out and doing these direct action raids, pulling Intel, and then using that to go and hit another target as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, that using that intelligence as quickly as possible. Is that something you saw or is that something, is that kind of how it worked? Yeah, it's something that developed, um, and I, I it's called SSE or sensitive site exploitation. Maybe they have a different name for it today. I'm sure they're better at it now than we were. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, it, it became a, a sort of, there was always um, what we would have referred to beforehand as like an EPW in search, like an enemy prisoner of war search. Mm -hmm. You're searching the bodies, mm -hmm. you know, on the battlefield, see if they have any maps in their pockets, things like that, dog tags, anything you can use for intelligence purposes. Um, but what we didn't have at that time was a, a methodological sort of way, a methodical way of searching buildings and structures and, in a sense, cataloging evidence. Because now we're into this realm of not just combat, we're into counterterrorism, and we have to gather evidence um, that could be potentially used to convict terrorists in some sort of court of law or military tribunal, whether it's, you know, down at Gitmo or it's a local Iraqi or Afghani court or however that's going to work. I don't think we even knew. Mm -hmm. um, we did realize we had to have some methodical way of gathering evidence and bagging it and having like a chain of custody um, so that you can both, um, both for the courtroom reasons I just talked about, but also for intelligence gathering. Like if you just come with a big like black garbage bag full of shit, and hand it to <laughs> Intel people like, well, what is this? Where did yeah. this come from? Like, what am I even supposed to do with this? So SSE was developed to kind of rectify some of those situations. And, um, 
by the next deployment, 2005, we definitely kind of had that down to an art form, as I recall. Yeah, we had, um, I know for a while in Afghanistan, the Marines brought in law enforcement professionals, you know, the LEPs is what we called them, to help us with that, to do DNA testing and like just the, the stuff you wouldn't think about, like you're saying, like if you didn't know about it, you know, why are we doing this? Oh, you DNA test and do this? Okay. I mean, it makes sense what they're doing, but I guess one of those things, if you don't know, you don't know. And we had a FBI HRD with us, um, both in that Afghanistan deployment and then the next one for Iraq, we had HRD guys with us. I, and I, I believe it was to help facilitate that. Interesting. That's cool. Interesting. People, there's uh, Someone asked me a question on my uh, YouTube channel the other day about like, hey, is HRT the same level as you know dev group or tier whatever? And I'm like, dude, they're all great, man. Like they're all, if you want to put them all in that same level, yeah, I guess they're all up there. Like they're all, but they all have their own specific jobs. You know, like right, HRT right. has its job to do that they do very well. And uh, so it's weird how people kind of put those together. That's interesting that, you know, having someone like that. I've also heard of guys having DEA agents come and work with them too, you know, to try to do something with the poppy. I don't know. There was so much of it over there. I don't know what you could do with it, but uh, try to deal with that somehow. Um, you talked about the recce team. You know, it was like a newer thing. Was that kind of a, a throwback to the LERPs, the long range reconnaissance patrol kind of model, or is that something different? In, in a sense, yeah, it kind of was. Um, and again, I, I'm not sure that I can speak to what they're doing today, okay, um, yeah. but this, okay, was, yeah. this was brand new, um, 2004. And what had happened was the Ranger Regiment had, a, had and has a unit um, called the Regimental Reconnaissance Detachment. It's the Regimental Reconnaissance Company. Uh, and their job, um, they were created in the 1980s, and their job was to recon um, airfields and preparation for airfield seizures, which mm -hmm. is one of the main missions of the mm -hmm. Ranger Regiment. Um, so we had those guys to do recon for us for a long time, but they sort of, I guess, worked their, worked their way out of a job. I mean, they were very good at what they did. So before we got cut off, we were talking about um, Ranger... Uh, now I'm all messed up now. The reconnaissance uh, portion of our team on uh, the Ranger Battalion, if you want to get into that again. Yeah, so... What had happened was that we had the Regimental Reconnaissance Detachment. Uh, today, it's the Regimental Reconnaissance Company. And they uh, their job was to do recon for the Ranger Regiment. And they kind of worked themselves out of a job in the sense that they got sucked up into JSOC and started doing operations for them. Um, so that left the battalions without any sort of reconnaissance element. And... To rectify that, they created a uh, battalion reconnaissance platoons. Mm -hmm. um, so this was a brand new capability for the battalions, uh, and this was their first deployment. Um, deploying, uh, you know, like you said earlier, that there was kind of a throwback to LERPs in the sense that these guys were would work in five, six man teams um, with maybe with a JTAC, maybe with a sniper. Um, and they would act as scouts. They could go out and, uh, in, you know, low visibility vehicles um, disguised as Afghan people and or soldiers or whatever the case may be, um, or do aerial reconnaissance, whatever, whatever really needed to be done to get out there and do recon on targets for Rangers. That's a, that's, I mean, that sounds like an awesome job to be honest. You know, that's like a lot of people, I think when they think of recon or reconnaissance of some dude in a ghillie suit laying in a bush, you know, and it's way more than that, especially nowadays, like you talked about in Afghanistan, where you got people going out and intermingling with the, the local populace and stuff, you know, unknown to them. Um, was that ever something you considered doing or wanted to do? And is that an extra like end doc or anything to get into that? Or how does that work? Uh, I'm pretty sure that they do now have their own selection and their own training course and, and everything. I'm sure it's much more advanced now that they've that they've matured that capability mm -hmm. since it was first stood up, you know, a long time ago now. Like we're talking like 15 years ago. Yeah, for sure. That uh, uh, it, it wasn't something that I necessarily thought about doing per se, um, just because I, I was a new sniper at the time. Um, so I was still learning the ropes at my own job. Yeah. Definitely. When, now that you've gone and been to Afghanistan, like you said, you joined, you know, initially you were going to join the French Foreign Legion because you just wanted to get into a combat unit. Now you've had that taste of it. You've been there. You've done that. The, you've gone into the great unknown, you know, 
what was your kind of thought process afterwards? Did it seem like, was it what you thought it would be? Was it worth it to you? I mean, obviously you went back. It, it, it Honestly, it was a dream come true. Uh, I was exactly where I wanted to be doing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, getting to roll out on combat operations with uh, a highly trained, motivated force like the Rangers. Mm -hmm. uh, it was mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. You know, I had some great leaders. I had, you know, with my sniper partner, um, you know, some great training. Uh, I was under the wings of some really good guys. We had the best equipment. We had the best helicopters. Um, so, I mean, it, it was an amazing experience. It really was. You can't really. You can't... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and also just being in such a, a remote, austere location like Afghanistan, um, at times it feels like you're on another planet. Yeah, for sure. At yeah, times it definitely sure. does. It's a, it is an interesting place. I try to like convey some of the some things you see in Afghanistan. It's just like, you can't really understand it. Some of the stuff, unless you've been there and you've seen, you know, we always say there's like, when I was on the advisor team, um, there's an Afghan solution to an Afghan problem. You know, that it doesn't matter if that's what was made or designed to fix that issue. They will work it some way to, to make it work. It's just how the, it's just how their people are seeing the craziest looking vehicles drive down the road that are pieced together from probably 30 other vehicles. Uh, yeah. Afghanistan's an interesting place for sure. Um, I, I, I'm sitting here thinking about that and I, I totally forgot the question I was going to ask you, you know, being at, being at Ranger battalion and, and other units like that, where there's a high expectation of individual performance and, there's a sense of people that just want to be there, you know, is a different world than being in like, I'm assuming the big army. I know in the big Marine Corps, you know, being in these, working in these small specialized teams and doing those missions was way more fulfilling for me. You know, when I was with Anglico doing stuff with those guys, than being at like, I was a mechanic, you know, when I first came in the Marine Corps, there was two different levels of like, this is really cool. I'm in the Marine Corps. And, and what, what was the Marine Corps? You know, did, did you guys have that same kind of feeling like you can appreciate like, hey, everyone that's here wants to be here. You know, everyone here is trying their hardest to be good at their job. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hate to use like such a kind of cliched metaphor, but it's kind of like you're with modern day samurai. Right. They're like <laughs> yeah. they're, they're making an art form into what they do. They're trying to be the best at every little single task that they're given. Um, so it's just an incredible environment to be in. And, and, you know, I can safely say, you know, I was average. I, I was an average guy. Yeah, um, that's yeah. on, it's on a relative scale, I guess. I was, I was in an elite unit, but I was just an average guy in a elite unit. And I was very fortunate to be able to work around, um, that kind of caliber of soldier. For sure. And, you know, that was kind of my whole point in starting this podcast. It was, there's so many like normal dudes, you know, you see walking down the street that you would never know unless they told their story, the things that they've seen or done. You know, one of the first guys I interviewed, I, I bring this story up a few times on here. His name's Jerry. My neighbor told me about him and I'd seen this guy walking down the street a few times and I thought he was just some beach bum because I lived in the Oceanside right next to the beach. And I thought this was some old beach bum. You know, he always seemed with his shades and a big hat on. And uh, he's like, yeah, he was in the Marines. He was a fighter pilot. You should talk to him. He's like, I know you got that podcast. You should hit him up. And I was like, all right, man. So he introduces me and turns out this dude is like 98% blind. He's like walking to and from the beach, barely even able to see. And he went blind because he was doing a bombing run in Vietnam and got shot down. And the canopy like busted through the windshield and blinded him as he ejected. And I'm like, dude, like. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I never, no one would ever know that story. Like, unless you told that and, and it's unfortunate. He doesn't tell, he doesn't really talk about it. He has a group of pilot friends and they're the only ones that know their own stories. Cause they have like an email chain, all these old mm -hmm. Vietnam vet pilot dudes that stay in touch with each other. And I'm like, man, you guys really need to get these stories out. Cause it's, it's history. It's, it's very important. And it and everyone has done more than somebody and less than somebody else, you know? And I think too many people get wrapped around like, what did I do in the military compared to what these other people did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we all served like our own little small part, you know, and, and I think it's good to record all of those experiences. A lot of those guys who they have the most insane stories, they're the least <laughs> apt to talk about them. Um, and you kind of have to pry them out of it, but yeah. you know, I do, 
you know, I, I maybe this is a self-serving statement to some extent, but I, I think that what I do, what you do, there are a few others out there as well who who have similar podcasts, and it's not really about like tooting my own horn. It's about allowing other people to tell their stories um, and hopefully inform and educate the next generation. Yeah, for sure. And you know, and, and speaking of informing and educating, when you came back from that first deployment you probably had a whole group of new guys, right? Did you, were, were you, was it up to you to start training these guys or were you still considered a new guy? I mean, the deployments are a little bit shorter than what I'm used to. So I don't know how the, the vibe is in the Ranger Battalion. I was still relatively junior, um, but the way things worked out, I did end up um, taking a fire team um, in weapons squad, um, first platoon over in ACO. And um, yes, <laughs> I, I had new guys assigned but uh, now it's my responsibility to show them how things are supposed to work. It's such a crazy concept because you were probably 22 or so at the time. And now you're in charge of like teaching these, he, these people how to survive in a combat situation or like, Hey, this is the most efficient way to kill a dude, you know, yeah. like just to, to think in the military, it's like, whatever, that's just, you know, whatever, that's the job. But outside of the military, it's hard for me to imagine like regular people understanding that kind of thought process where you're like, Hey, if I get smoked in the face, I need hey. you to step up and grab the radio and take over, you know? Yeah. yeah. 21 year olds leading 18 year olds. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it when, when you put it in that context, it's kind of horrifying. Right. <laughs> right. It, but it's also, uh, it, it's also, you know, best job in the army. Yeah. I mean, best job, best job in the world. And it's incredibly gratifying, um, as intimidating as it is at times, to put to have that much responsibility dumped on you as a young person. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a really uh, important, formative experience to have. For sure. And I honestly think that that level of responsibility given to someone, and I, I don't know, I think that is why a lot of people have an issue when they get out of the military. Because everything else just kind of seems like bullshit now, you know, after you've done something that's like you're riding the edge constantly, you know, and at any time you could be killed. Something could happen. It's dangerous. Like it's inherently dangerous. No matter how many safeties you put into play, you're still dropping a live bomb on something, you know, okay. something bad could happen. And then you get out. Now it's like, Hey, I'm a insurance salesman, insurance. you know, or whatever yeah. you choose to do. Yeah. It's like, I understand why a lot of guys have issues after they get out and it's like, I, they don't feel like they're fulfilling the most that they could be, you know, especially in war where every single decision you make, everything you do is so important and there's so much riding on it. And now, I mean, today, the worst thing that happened was we were in the middle of this interview and my computer shut down to do a, a, an automatic update and it, and it interrupted our interview. Worst thing that happened to me today. I can't believe it. But I mean, really, the, just the stakes are so much lower. Mm -hmm. Just reset mm -hmm. the computer, get it back up, and we're good to go. Um, and yeah, I think absolutely so many of us, including myself, you know, struggle with those things. Um, not not so much anymore, but in that transition out of the military, it was difficult. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's I, I think, again, I think that's just one of the more difficult things that a lot of people go through is, and you're right, I do the same thing. It's I, it's hard to see something as not being bullshit. A lot of times I've had people tell me like, dude, you're so late. You're so relaxed. You're so laid back. Like when something supposedly crazy is happening, I'm like, dude, it's just cause it doesn't matter. You're still going to go home at the end of the day. You know, like yeah. you're going to fix it down the line. You're going to make a correction and it'll be, it'll be okay. And the world will continue to, you know, spin and you'll go home and whatever it's, we're making a big deal about something that's not a big deal, but yeah. Um, to transition though. So you, you said your second deployment with the Ranger battalion was to Iraq. Was that correct? Yeah. Did you notice a difference in your workup now that you were going to Iraq? Was the mission different in Iraq? I think uh, the mission was different. It was it was um, urban, time sensitive targets we were hitting, um, going after high value targets. Mm -hmm. um, you know the the you know top guys in the city, uh, the emirs and so on, um, who were a lot of foreign fighters, a lot of Al Qaeda in Iraq, as we called them. Mm -hmm. um, I think as far as the workup leading into it, it was just that Ranger Battalion had um, done a better job by that point at harmonizing, making the training, uh, the pre-mission training uh, reflect more accurately the scenarios that those soldiers were about to go into on the deployment um, so that, you know, maybe previously 
it was a little bit more of that old world, you know, patrolling through the wood line mm -hmm. um, to prepare you for deployment. Now it's like, no, we, we were actually um, doing a lot of mount training, um, shoot houses, and even what uh, is sometimes referred to as RUT or realistic urban training, where they will find a building actually out in town. Um, we hit an abandoned middle school um, during that training workup, um, went out there, and that, that was our training objective. I mean, it doesn't, it, as far as like a realistic feeling scenario, um, that was it. So it, it, was a, it was a pretty good training program. Oh, and also um, it involved a lot of working with the strikers, the striker vehicle that we would have in Iraq. We had those vehicles at Fort Benning, and we were able to train on them, familiarize ourselves with them, um, so that we were prepared once we hit the ground in Iraq. Were you guys fans of using the Striker vehicle? Was that like the preferred vehicle? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think it was pretty good. Um, I mean, it's a heavy eight-wheeled, up-armored vehicle with all the slat armor around it for RPGs. So it, it definitely is um, more cumbersome and awkward than mm -hmm. driving around yeah. in Humvees, especially if we're talking about the, we're talking about the old Humvees, the gun trucks yeah. that have any armor on them. Yeah, going to yeah. the Striker is totally different. Um, the soldiers, my guys and weapon squad would, um, drive and crew the strikers and they went to the school. I believe it was in Fort Lewis. I didn't go with them though. Um, they went up there to the school to, um, for a couple of weeks to actually get qualified to drive the striker and operate it. Um, and it worked out pretty well for us in Iraq. I think. Did you have any like preconceived notions built up for being in Afghanistan that like got blown away when you went to Iraq? Cause people that have never been to either one just think middle East and probably think that they're, they're very similar when in reality they're not at all. Totally different. Totally different. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure some of it didn't hit me until I actually arrived, but I mean, from the training and the description we were being given as we led up to that deployment, I think I understood that this was going to be a bit more intense and that we were going to be in more of a fast paced, you know, urban environment. And what was your role during this deployment? And, you know, can you talk about some of the different missions that you did? Yeah, I, I was a team leader or a gun team leader and weapons squad. Uh, so that made me uh, what's called the TC on a striker, uh, the tactical commander, or it comes from the older term tank commander. Um, so you're kind of the guy up in the turret telling the driver, go left, go right, do this, do that. You're directing the gun. Uh, it's an RWS gunner, the 50 cal gunner. Mm -hmm. um, and then there'd be sometimes a tail gunner, also the 240. You're kind of orchestrating all of that. Um, when I was in the running, the, when I was the lead vehicle, I would actually have the Falcon view up, and I'm having to navigate through the city and navigate the uh, the entire convoy um, to the objective, get us where we need to go. In addition to that, though, um, we would also do what I was just describing. That would be the ground assault force, the GAF. We'd also do HAPS, um, the helicopter assault force, and in those instances, I'd be more like a normal dismounted gun team leader where it would be me, uh, a, soul, a ranger that has the Mark 48 machine gun, and then another ranger who's carrying ammo. Um, they, they wouldn't be carrying a tripod on that deployment, but they'd be carrying extra ammo. Um, and we'd be in a dismounted environment after getting off the helicopters and, and moving through town or whatever else we had going on. Um, so in short, that, that those were the two different types of missions we were doing. And you guys were basically going out daily, right? If not more than one time a day? Yeah, well, I mean, it was very common to go out um, multiple times during one 24-hour cycle. We would work, uh, as I recall, 24 hours on, 24 hours off. Um, initially, it was just supposed to be us going out at night, but very quickly that turned into us going out at all hours, day and night. Um, and it was very common for us to run you know, multiple missions in a day and have follow-ons you know, coming off of each one of those missions. Um, so the, the pace was very quick. It was very fast. I mean, it, it, the only time that we really got to like rest and sleep and just sit around watching television was when a sandstorm would blow through mm -hmm. and it grounded all the ISR. Yeah. Um, so that was really the only time that we kind of got a break. That's like the hallmark of the Ranger deployment, right? Just that fast pace, you know, and that's why you guys are normally only going out for three months at a time. Do you think you could sustain that pace for longer or do you think three months is probably about right for something like that? I, I think three months is, is about it. I mean, I think honestly, I was speaking for myself. I mean, I think my nerves were pretty frayed by the end of it and mm -hmm. when I look back on it and I suspect it was the same for a lot of the guys, you know, I remember as we were taking a lot of contact, 
uh, as I recall, especially towards the end. And I remember making this smart ass remark to my squad leader, like my goal is just to survive the next 24 hours. And he was like, yep, exactly. <laughs> okay. You, you figured it out. I'm like, all right. Good yeah. Out. Yeah. <clears throat> what year was this? We were in 05, 06 timeframe. Yeah. Yeah. 2005. What was the IED situation like then? Was it, was this before it was really ramping up or is this about the time that it's really becoming more of an effective tool for the insurgency? It was starting to ramp up and, um, I would like that we never got IED'd our convoy. I'd like to think it was because we were, you know, tactically proficient. And I think that was part of it. Um, but I'm sure also luck played a big part of it. You know, we got lucky. Um, you know, I, I remember going out a daylight mission one time and we took a tactical pause on the side of the road because we're waiting for this HPT's vehicle um, to arrive before we hit him. And um, across the way, across the boulevard, there's a, another striker falling to another unit. And there was just like flames belching out of the back of the ramp down. It looked like Dragon's Breath just belching out of the back of the striker. And they had got hit by an IED and it lit up whatever kind of ammo or fuel or whatever they had in that vehicle. And it was just going up in a fireball. And yeah. um, there were other strikers driving around and their PL pulled up and talked to me for a moment. He was like in a panic, you know, which I understand. Um, so that, that, those threats were out there. Yeah. What was like the biggest threat for you guys? Were you guys mostly receiving like pot shots as you're moving through the city or were, were you like involved in like actual ambushes? Like, where's anybody, you know, was that a situation at all? Pot shots. Yeah. Ambushes. Yeah. I, I think the, the scenario we feared um was getting into a situation where we had been uh where we could be ward inside a building and then they would just blow it up on us mm. um or or ward into a building where they have prepared firing positions like sandbag positions yeah uh, we had situations where the enemy as quiet as we tried to be where the enemy would creep up onto the rooftops and try to ambush us from above and Having sniper overwatch is a good thing because they saved our they saved our ass a number of times. Um, so th those were you know some of the some of the problems um, that we dealt with or that we were concerned with at the time. I mean it's got it's got to be hard to sneak up on anybody when you're rolling up at a striker. Yeah, um, they, they could be kind of quiet, but we would also try to um, do like um, you know displace you know yeah. park you know, a, a few blocks away and then the, the dismounts would get out and move into place. And you're just kind of like moving like ninjas to try to surround the compound, yeah. surround the house um, from multiple angles. You have sniper overwatch up. Um, so we're, we're as deliberate and tactical about it as we could. And, and I think that, you know, doing that saved a lot of lives. Everyone came home from that deployment, even though we had wounded. That's all um, you can ask for. Yeah. You know, if you're out every day and sometimes multiple times a day doing these raids and arresting these people or hitting these HVTs and stuff, do you feel like the targets were legitimate or, I mean, were they being prosecuted properly or were they just being, you guys are going to pick them up and then like their, the Iraqi court system or whatever is letting them go a couple weeks later and you're picking them up again? Is it, was that a situation at all? That that's such an interesting question, and it's something that I, I I grapple with to this day journalistically. Is uh, you know, the people we target, the the targeting processes we use, um, sometimes are completely legitimate, and we're mm -hmm. taking bad actors off the battlefield, and sometimes they're not. Um, and the scenario, you know, in some of the the operations that I was involved in, some of these guys were really really bad guys like beyond any shadow of a doubt they were bad guys and, and there was evidence um they took up arms against us and we we killed them in combat i mean some of some of these cases are pretty clear cut mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and others they were not uh and they were ridiculous um there was one case where they had us hit the same house three nights in a row so we went out there and we blew down the door three nights in a row we'd really? go and blow really? down the door then the civil affairs guys would come, buy them a new door. They'd put it up. We'd come out the next night, blow the door down, repeat the process. And they kept sending us there because some analyst or somebody kept telling us that there were bad guys there. Um, I, there's an, when I was in SF on the next deployment in 2009, there's an even more egregious case where they kept sending us to the same house over and over and over again. And I found out it was because there's a interpreter 
there's only one or two interpreters who spoke um, Turkmani. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this, she thought that she was hearing over um, intercepts, thought that the person living in this house sounded like a previous intercept we had of a terrorist. So it's just like, in her opinion, that sounds like a guy I had heard previously. And so we were being told by the JSOC task force to go and hit this house all the time. Go hit him, go hit him, go hit. And we would go and, you know, in air quotes, hit the house, which consisted us of us knocking on the door, going in and having tea with them, and then heading back to our base. So like, we checked it out, it's okay. A couple of weeks later, they'd be like, oh, he's back, he's back, you gotta go hit this house. And We'd go and have tea with them every time just to keep um, JSOC out of there. Keep my old my old teammates, keep them out of there from blowing down somebody's door who doesn't need to have it blown down. Um, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's crazy that one person has that effect, you know, where they're – now you have a, a team, a, a group of rangers coming down and kicking somebody's door or knocking in your case after you see that it's kind of bullshit just because of a hunch. You know, that's, Some that's insane. Some, sometimes the intelligence is dead on, um, highly accurate, highly precise, and sometimes it's total bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the question is, what's the percentage? Right? Like, how, how many of these are good hits and how many of them are not? Um, understand, too, like General McChrystal's find, fix, finish stratagem um, put an emphasis on the rapid cycle of raids and mm -hmm. conducting mm -hmm. as many raids as possible. So... In doing that, I think we just went hog wild, um, especially Ranger Battalion, in hitting anything and everything, um, sometimes on very flimsy intelligence. Now, was that because that kind of pace, because he wanted to like use the intelligence before it went bad? I mean, just try to get as much out of the intelligence as you can? Or is it more of a pressure campaign by, hey, we're just going to go to whatever might be an issue and just see what happens? As it was explained to me, it was, it was a bit of both. Um, I had, I remember one of our commanders telling us that he doesn't mind us hitting dry hole. Like a dry hole being a target where there's nothing there. There's no mm -hmm. bad guys, mm -hmm. no, no enemy activity. That I don't mind dry holes because that keeps up the pressure on the, on the Al-Qaeda network or the Haqqani network or whoever it is. So I, I don't mind dry holes. I mean, you can see that to a point, but like you said, what's the, what's the, what's the impact on the civilian populace? You know, how are you, the, I IO campaign is struggling when you're doing and, you know, going and knocking random people's doors down all the time that have nothing to do with the insurgency. I mean, and, and the reality is, is you're building the insurgents. And I think no one, I think everybody understands that nowadays. And I think I, I witnessed it in Afghanistan, the targeting, the, you know, how in depth the targeting would have to be to even drop on somebody. We would be taking contact and still not get approval to drop on someone because they're next to a mud wall. And now we consider mud walls compounds, you know, and it's like ridiculous, so it, it, completely yeah. ridiculous. And then sometimes you'd see some random shit where they would just shoot bombs off at some random area for almost no reason. You're like, what is, who's making the rules here and how are they being applied? Like it, it's kind it, of it's really. It's really interesting you bring this up because I'm working on a story right now that deals specifically with this subject about how there were times when the ROE became way too loose, mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. it would be like schizophrenic, like it would bounce over to it being ridiculously uh, restrictive where you have soldiers in combat and we should be flying close air support to, to support those guys on the ground and we're not. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to untangle all of the, the uh, legal and technical aspects of why this happened. And it's very complicated. It, it is extremely complicated. And I remember, you know, going to Afghanistan as a JTAC, you have to go sit through these briefings and they brief you on the different ROEs, actual ROE numbers. Like this is ROE 134 or whatever. And then when you gave your nine line and everything, you'd have to pass what ROE are you, you know, conducting this attack under just to make sure everyone's on the same page. It was kind of wild. And, and on top of the ROEs, the people that are just trying to, I don't know, trying to protect their own careers was kind of out of control. One one time I remember uh, my friend Alcala, he was, I was working with him and saying, and he was the company JTAC for 3.6, I think it was Kilo 3.6. And we had some guys that were, they were huddled in this blown up building. Like it had already been blown up. It just had a couple busted up walls there. And you could see inside the building, they had uh, PKM, RPG, you know, different weapons and stuff. And they're running across the street and they're running parts of an IED to put in this culvert. And they're running one piece at a time, you know, and we're watching all this happen. And we have a Harrier come on station 
and um, he's trying to work the Harrier to drop a bomb on it. We're trying to get the timing right because they won't let us drop on this compound that's already been blown up because it's considered a structure, you know, even though you can see everything in it. Um, and I remember one time the dude was running across to run the wires or something, and the Harrier comes around and ready. Everything t- t- timing is perfect. Battalion gives approval. JTAC is ready to give clear hot. And then the company commander is like, wait, wait, wait. Cause he's on the phone with the battalion. He's like, wait, wait. And then uh, I'll call a board set. And he's like, what, what's going on, sir? What's ha- what happened? And he's like, I just want to make sure the battalion commander really wants to drop this. And we're like, dude, it's already approved. Like, and those dudes ended up getting away. We had to send the Afghans over there to, to go pull the IED and stuff like that. And then I sweated every time I went over that fucking culvert, I thought I was going to get blown up, you know? It's a, it's a really immoral and unethical way to deploy and use soldiers in that sort of manner. Um, and it's interesting that I'm finding also is a lot of, uh, a lot of us as veterans, we, we blame politicians and politicians have plenty of blame <laughs> that they yeah. need to accept responsibility for. But there's a lot of it also falls on on us, on the military itself, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. uh, you would have commanders who are like risk adverse, like you were saying. They would put more restrictions than are necessary on top of the laws of land warfare and and other approved ROEs. Mm -hmm. And there is also a lack of education and a lack of understanding in some situations about what the ROE allows and what doesn't. Um, And and correct me if I'm wrong. Did you have any... um, strong understanding of the ROE um, back when you were doing your train-ups prior to deployment? No. Or was it something that you had you had to get there, land in Afghanistan, and now you're having to read through all these phone books full of information to try to understand it? So when I when I went to TCP school and became a JTAC, Tactical Air Control Party School, and uh, I, went, I be, got JTAC certified, what normally happens is once you finish TCP school, you're a certified JTAC, but you are not designated. You have to go and do day controls, night controls, live missiles, you know, helos, everything using lasers. You have to do all these different tasks to show, okay, this dude's legit. Then the commander signs off and now you're designated. That means you can go and control aircraft on your own. I came in when the need for JTACs was super high. I think I did two or three controls before I went to Afghanistan. I never even saw a live bomb drop until I went to Afghanistan, to be honest, because I went to TCP school on the East coast and there's no ranges on the East Coast that allow you to drop these 500,000 pound bombs, except for down in like Avon Park. I think I think they allow you down there, but there was no where TCP school goes. There's no place to do that. So I actually deployed and hadn't even seen a live bomb drop in person until I saw a 500 pound bomb hit the side of a mountain. I was like, oh, OK, that's like the real effects of it. And what happens is, is when you get there or when back in the day, when you get there, this is 2013 time frame. Um, you'd show up, you'd get to Leatherneck, and then you would go meet the, reg- I think either the regimental or division air officer. And then they would give you like a couple days of classes. Like you'd have to sit there and go sit through classes and then take a ROE test. It was like a 40 question test or something like that. And then you had, to, after that, you were certified like, hey, you're good to go, you know, go do great things. And then it was on you to understand the ROEs and apply them as required. Obviously, I, I'm, I mean... It sounds a little crazy when you when I put it like that, but the air officers in there are obviously there to back you up and and you know and the guys working in the COC and stuff. I was that guy, you know, on my first deployment. So it's a lot to take in for sure. Yeah. And, and so yeah. the the thing becomes also is all of this uh, to have uh, everyone should be working in harmony, but for the ROE to work the way it's supposed to, the JTAC has to understand it. The pilots all have to understand it. The commander has to understand it. Uh, the JAG has to understand it. Whoever is involved in the nine line and the legal clearance and, and that entire technical process of clearing mm-hmm. airstrikes mm-hmm. has to have a thorough understanding of the ROE. And if somebody in that chain doesn't, it can completely fuck everything up. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. It, it can definitely mess things up. And you, it was not, I, I mean, I saw a guy get benched on a deployment because he didn't mess up the ROEs. I just want to put it out. Like the job is super, you know, serious. No one takes it lightly and the targeting and stuff is very serious and taken very, you know, taken very seriously at at all times. And I remember there was a guy who got benched because there was some IED emplacers. I want to say it was like next to a tower, next to a cemetery or something like that. We're watching these guys put in some IEDs. He gets two aircraft talked on. Everything's good to go. I want to say they were Cobras. Everything's good to go. They're going to do Hellfire followed up by rockets and guns. And 
we're waiting on approval. Hey, battalions approved. I think the battalion approved. I can't remember. It, I think what happened was, is he requested approval over the radio and didn't get approval. He heard like static and thought that was them giving approval, but that it just didn't come through. Right. And he gave, or no, the pilot thought this is what happened. The pilot thought he said cleared hot. The first pilot shot without approval. He heard the static shot. And then the second guy requested clearance and the JTAC was like, well, cleared hot and went ahead and cleared him because the first dude had already shot. And so that became like an issue. We all had to go through like retraining because of that, you know? So that's how serious they took it. So, I mean, yeah, we, we take the job very seriously, but there's a lot of things that could happen like that, you know, like a little issues that happen when you're working with air support. Yeah. But, the, the wheels come off the process at times. And, and I don't think it's necessarily because they are bad people or bad soldiers. For sure. Um, it can, it can just be a misunderstanding. Sometimes it is somebody who is too risk averse or too worried about their career, but sometimes it's just, you know, misunderstandings about the process. Um, so anyway, this is something that I hope that I can write about accurately um, in the near future. Oh, I mean, it's something, you know, it's, that's the reality of the situation. And I'll tell you, even guys, I know guys that have followed the procedure like they were supposed to and have dropped on civilians. You know, I know one guy specifically that did that. Everything was followed perfectly and they dropped on civilians on accident. And then another situation where the Ford Observer was calling in high Mars and someone else messed up on the other end. It was supposed to be like an at my command mission and someone else took command, even though they shouldn't have and fired it without the approval and killed civilians. And although very rare, I mean, that, that kind of thing does happen. And it's unfortunate, you know, we talk about in where we used to talk about in the, and training and the JTAC training and the primer course. And we had new guys coming up that fratricide cases and stuff still occur, you know, with all this technology and with everything that we've done. And I mean, you still, even, even not just at big Marine Corps, big army level, even in special operations level, you know, there's a JTAC in the special operations that have dropped on themselves because either the JTAC or the pilot, there was some kind of error and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a weird world to be in. And like you were talking about with the Ranger battalion, it's one of those ones where everyone's expected to come to work you know, and when, if you show up and you don't know what you're doing, like there's no, there's no real leeway for that. We're going to, we're going to teach you and give you the guidance one, because we want you to succeed Two, because the Marine Corps needs JTACs and you know, the military in general, everybody wants a JTAC to go out with them anytime they do anything. So we need the bodies. Um, but some guys just don't, you just don't get it. And you're like, dude, this guy's going to be dangerous. We're going to push him to the side. Or if we have to keep them then they get put into more of like an administrative role where they're not going to be controlling and stuff like that. And it's understood, but it's a small community and you get a reputation like that and people know who you are and stuff. And you know, you're just not going to get work. Yeah. yeah. We've all yeah. seen it. You know, I had a, you know, on the, on the ground side, you know, working, we obviously have practice side and, and all kinds of stuff that happens um, in uh, you know, just on the ground. And uh I don't know, man. I mean, we had a guy in, in uh, my platoon who we had to assign to make coffee for the colonel. The rest of the and I, I worked hard with him. Others worked hard with him to try to get him up to speed. And looking back on it, I, he was so incompetent. I think that he just didn't want to be there. That yeah. Yeah. he was like, "This isn't for me." I wish he had just come out and said that, though, rather than going out on patrols and putting people's lives at risk. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, for sure. But yeah, we he had he had to be kind of removed and set aside. And you're, you know, you're going to hang out in the talk now. It sucks for those guys too, because now when you pull someone back like that, it's an obvious, it's obvious why. So now you're like, man, is this dude going to be like, okay, like how's their mental health now that we're telling them that they're kind of a piece of shit and they can't come out with us, you know, like it's, it's a bad situation all around. So yeah, you definitely want to identify all that stuff before you go down range. But I've seen units where they're like, dude, we know he sucks, but he's got to go. Like you have to take him. There's one we're not going to we're not going to take him and put him in another team because that's just what's going to happen. They're going to rotate him somewhere else, deal with it. And it's like, that's like you're expecting. And this is at Anglico specifically and Anglico is not special operations at all. However, Anglico is also expected to go and support special operations a lot of times, you know? And we're like, how are you going to send this incompetent dude that we all know is incompetent out to possibly go support these guys or represent the Marine Corps? Is that the face you want to provide to the people, you know, to the customer, I guess, if you want to call 
these guys that we're supporting, like, is that who you want to be representing us? Like, no, man. Like, and so, but it's one of those things, like there's only, the well is only so full. You can only pull from so many people and, and the good dudes can only do so many deployments before they're like, fuck this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a step back. Let, let Johnny go deploy, you know? Yeah. And it becomes a problem when, you know, if we all know this guy is problematic and we deploy him and get a bunch of people killed, like that's kind of on us. Like we all knew, Yeah, you know, it's kind of on us. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I can understand that we, we had with that individual, we had kind of even in Ranger Battalion, the same sort of thing that he was, he bounced between weapons squad and the line, like maybe two or three times before they finally put him like over in a safe place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, because I mean, honestly, we did need, we needed every Ranger we had at that moment. You know, and the shitty thing is too, is that some of these people are great people. They're probably awesome. Just regular Joe dude but they're just not good at coming out on operations where like lives are literally on the line and you have to make that tough decision. Like, Hey man, I'm not going to risk someone else because you're incompetent, you know, because you can't find your own location or you can't give good targeting data or you can't, you know, move in a patrol properly. You know, it's just, I don't know, but again, the well is only so full. So there's only so many people that can do these things, but it is what it is. Um, to, We'll move on from this uh, a little bit. You you left the Rangers and you went over to uh, Q Course, knocked that out to go, you know, Special Forces and stuff like that. Can you kind of talk? I know you can't really talk about like Q Course itself and Robin Sage, or I don't know what you can talk about with it, but can you kind of compare it to your Ranger assessment and selection? Kind of what were the, some of the similarities? What were some of the differences? And do you think any of the training from one should be shifted over to the other? Like, is there some stuff in Rangers that you thought were really valuable that they don't do in special forces that you think should, you know, move over to that course? Yeah, good question. Um, so the selection processes are different uh, because the units are different. They have different mm -hmm. missions and they have different cultures. Um, so the special forces assessment and selection, one of the big differences is that everything is very much an individualized event. Like in, in RIP, when in uh, the Ranger indoctrination, it's like they're looking for the perfect private. Mm -hmm. uh, in SFAS, they're looking for somebody who's self-motivated, um, that you can give him instructions and he's gonna be able to execute it on his own um, without somebody looking over his shoulder. Um, and there's also some things integrated in the SFAS to like, see, how do you interact with other people? Like, like for lack of a better term, like what's your bedside manner like? Mm -hmm. Like just mm -hmm. how, how do you relate to other people? Because that's such an important part of special forces about the, their mission and building rapport with uh, local populations and, and raising, you know, farms, you know, forces to fight. Um, if you're just an abrasive dick all the time, yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you're not really going to be able to do that. Um, so the selection accounts for a little bit of that. Um, SFAS is like four weeks long. It, it's tough. It's a tough course. At least I found it to be tough. Uh, and uh, it's pretty wore down by the end of it. I, I came right off of that deployment in 2005 to Iraq. Um, came off of that deployment. I did two weeks at Walter Reed, kind of like looking after some of the guys from our unit who had been hurt came back and went right into doing airfield seizures for two weeks, doing training. And then the next day after that, I was on a plane to Fayetteville to start selection. Uh, so I <laughs> jumped right into it. Um, there, there are different selection courses. Um, they, they select for somewhat different attributes, um, but I think they both were right for the types of units that they were selecting for. That's awesome. So after you finish the Q course, you finish Robin Sage, you get all that done. You were a, you were a weapon sergeant. Can you kind of explain what the different jobs within a special forces team are and what the weapon sergeant specifically does? Yeah, sure. So uh, you have a 12 man ODA uh, and there's two of each of the main MOSs on the ODA. So you're going to have two engineers, two medics, two combo guys, two weapons guys. Uh, then you're going to have your 18 Fox, who is your Intel NCO. You're going to have your uh, team sergeant, your warrant officer, and your team leader. So uh, the team leader is a captain. The team sergeant is a master sergeant. And the warrant officer is, is going to be like a, what, what was, uh, 
Yeah, it'll be a W01 um, normally. And uh, that that's constitutes the 12 man team. Uh, you know, the medics or special operations medics, they go through uh, the same course that Ranger medics go through. It's all kind of co located, uh, the SOCOM course. Um, the special forces medics got a little bit more. They get like, um, you know, what to do if like the village comes down with like typhoid, yeah. um, that kind of stuff. And like, I think they even do like some dentistry and animal husbandry stuff, as I recall. Um, the combo guys are obviously they, they deal with all of the radios, um, both tactical combo and like satcom and, and rigging up the, um, the, uh, Humvees or other vehicles with radios. Um, they handle all of the IT inside the op centers, uh, wh- you know, wiring the cat five cables and running all that kind of stuff. They're mm-hmm. responsible for all of it. Um, the engineers. So these are like combat engineers, uh, special forces engineers. They can build stuff and they can blow it up. Um, so they can do both. Um, they can be building a schoolhouse. They can be building, you know, the structures that you need on your base. Um, you know, your barracks or your op center or wh- whatever the hell else you need, they'll, they can do that kind of thing. Um, but they can also handle all the demolitions uh, and, and handle those sorts of missions as well. Uh, the weapons guys, uh, that so me and my junior on the team uh, were the two weapons sergeants, and we have the job of essentially supervising and overseeing and maintaining all the weapons on our ODA uh, as well as training our team on weapons and tactics, making sure that they're prepared to go. Uh, and then on deployment, uh, we are also uh, the you know head tactical instructors for whatever indigenous force we're partnered with. And we're kind of charged with training and leading them on operation. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, being a weapons sergeant was awesome. It was a, it was a great job. Is um, that what you wanted to do when you got to the, the ODA? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it was the MOS I, I requested uh, when I was in the Q course. What did the school entail? Just basic going over basically every weapon you have plus like foreign weapons or? Yes. The, the school was, um, <laughs> the 18 Bravo course was wild. Um, and it's a great experience. Um, and shooting all these foreign weapons and everything was amazing. Um, you also learn mortars. You learn how to do a fire direction center. Uh, the mortar systems, mechanical mortars, uh, anti-tank systems, anti-aircraft systems, uh, all kinds of cool stuff that you get to learn. Uh, our instructors uh, in the 18 Bravo course were some characters. Uh, if you, uh, maybe you've seen it. Have you ever seen that like parody CNN segment where it's talking to the weapons instructors at the Q course and they're all yelling at the students and everything? And it's done like know. a CNN news segment. And the, the one instructor, he's telling the he tells the reporter to eat a dick. <laughs> and that's like the, that's the acronym for how you learn in, in the 18 Bravo course. Mm. You go find it. Go find it I'll on YouTube. It it's, it's really funny. The only reason why I bring all that up is all of those instructors you see in that video. Those were my instructors when I went through the course. Uh, they they were funny. They were uh, <laughs> they were an entertaining wild group of guys. Yeah, yeah. that's I mean, hey, that's what you want to have, right? You don't want somebody right. too serious and stuff like that. Enjoy your time there. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, it, it, it was it was enjoyable <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> but it, it was definitely memorable. You still got to earn it, right? For sure. Yeah. 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 It's uh, interesting. Do you when you finish the Q course and you're you're going through your individual schools, do you guys all come back together? I know I understand the medical dudes go off and do their own training because theirs is a lot longer um, than the regular courses are. Does the, everyone else that was went through the Q course together and graduated, do they all kind of, you know, kind of go through the, all these schools together as well and then onto the teams together? Or are you guys all broken up and it's just, you know, random guys from different uh, courses? Throughout the Q course, you'll be broken up and you'll be all over the place. Um, but then in Robin Sage, everyone's going to come together. That's the cumulative final exercise for mm-hmm. the Q course. Mm-hmm. So everyone, all the MOSs, you're, you're, get, you're put onto like a mock ODA, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. all that ha- re- has the same representation of all of these different MOSs. Um, the officers who are going through the Q course, they're going to be the team leader. And then who gets selected to be the team sergeant, probably just going to be whatever the most senior NCO in the group. And someone gets picked out to be the Fox. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it's literally a, a mock ODA. 
um, that you go through Robin Sage in. Now, nowadays, I mean, so for those that don't know, I'm sure everyone knows at this point, but Special Forces, their whole point, right, is to go do that village stability operations, work with indigenous forces, build the army from within kind of deal. And I think we saw a lot of these embedded training teams and stuff like that in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and guys working with that. But we also had guys like me who were trained military advisors through the Marine Corps. And I know now the Army has the advisor brigade, I believe. Um, do you think that cuts into the SF mission? Are they, I don't know, are they changing up how they operate because of how they worked in Afghanistan and other places? Or is it, are they still, you think, still on the kind of the same path that they used to be? It's super controversial, and I think there's a, a series of different competing dynamics and agendas at play, as near as I can tell. Um, the SFAB notionally was created um, as, a, as a training and advisory unit that's going to go and train conventional foreign forces. Um, so the, the idea was that special forces was so overcast and, and they had so many different missions, which during the war on terror is true. They, I mean, the, the deployment cycle was vicious, mm -hmm. but we're just going to, we're just going to tell SF to go and train foreign soft units and give them that. And we're going to give the SFAB the entire mission of training conventional forces overseas. Um, whether or not that happens, I think remains to be seen. Um, depending on a number of different things. Um, I've heard interesting stories about how SFAB is actually employed overseas. Um, I, I think there's also some growing pains that they're going through. Mm -hmm. uh, how that's all going to pan out, I don't know. Um, I think special forces, at least what they say is they really want to double down on the unconventional warfare mission, uh, which I think would be a, a good thing. You saw them kind of recently cut loose of uh, what was known as the Commanders in Extremist Force, that sort of mm. direct action mission that they held on to, the direct action counterterrorism mission. That is no longer. They've kind of set that aside, and perhaps that's so that they can focus on unconventional warfare and some of their other metal tasks. Um, but I think a lot of this is sort of still in a state of flux, and I think with Afghanistan winding down, we're about to go into sort of like the third generation, I think some people called it like soft 3.0. Like, what is that going to look like? Look like, and I think um, we're still trying to figure some of that out. Yeah, it's going to be interesting uh, once all the you know troops are supposedly pulled out of Afghanistan. I think we all know that there's going to be obviously your diplomatic people hanging around, and then I'm I'm sure there's going to be some sort of some sort of special operations you know, footprint out there trying to keep tabs on what the Taliban's doing. It's really, you know, it's an unfortunate situation and you keep seeing these news stories about, Hey, this car bomb here killed what? I think it was like 90 kids or something just not like a month ago or a couple weeks ago. There's this killing here stories about like, what are the Afghan women going to do now? And it's, it's tough, man. It's like, man, you really feel sympathetic for these people but at the same time, I was an advisor and I was over there working with these people and you see the level of corruption and you're like, man, at some point you guys have to take over on your own. And if your decision is to be corrupt, you know, this fatted cab that you're over here that, you know, sucking from the teat of the United States, pulling all this stuff is going to go away. And how, what are you going to do? You know, and it's tough to see that. Someone like you who's been to Afghanistan, you know, and, and your friends have been to Afghanistan and all this stuff. How do you see kind of this transition? And how, what do you think about the people that kind of seem like they're trying to egg us into staying there even longer? Well, there, granted, there are people who are probably better qualified to comment on this subject than I am. Um, I, I only deployed there once. Uh, but, you know, of course, I, I continue to cover the subject um, off and on as needed. Um I think that it took an executive decision uh, on, on the part of the president to make the call to pull the plug, and there's no other way that it could have happened. I look, we were there for 20 years, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. whichever way you want to look at it, um, perhaps it's a combination of both. Like, we made a mess over there, but at the same time, as you point out, you have a government that is hopelessly corrupt. But the, the entire premise of what we were trying to do over there was flawed from the beginning, that we were trying to create a, like an Afghan federated state mm -hmm. that like they're going to be, you know, like Switzerland and they're going to have these federalized cantons and like a central parliament. Like that was never, ever going to happen in Afghanistan because of their culture 
Um, and the, the, we start off with these, we go into these counterinsurgency campaigns with this premise already in mind that there's a government there that is legitimate and that the enemy, the Taliban in this case, is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. the case. I mean, in some of these areas, the Taliban is seen as the legitimate governmental force. And some people over in Kabul are seen as the illegitimate government. And so we go over there and we're trying to fit a round peg into a square hole and we're trying to do it for 20 years and it's just not working. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. we've seen, we have not been honest with ourselves. It's like every general who comes into Afghanistan, we're about to turn the corner. Another 18 months, we're going to turn the corner and it doesn't happen. So it's, just, it's, it's sort of like, uh, national amnesia or something where we're all lying to ourselves, or I shouldn't say we're all lying to ourselves, but nonetheless, the, the end result is that we're just spinning our wheels and we're not being honest with ourselves about what we can realistically accomplish in the country. So I know this, this is a really difficult subject for some of our peers out there, um, people who spent a long time in Afghanistan. Um, they invested their, you know, a large, large portion of their adult lives into Afghanistan. They put blood, sweat, and tears into that country. They lost friends over there. They escorted their caskets of their fallen teammates home from there. So this is a emotional subject um, for a lot of guys, which I understand. But I mean, I think the question we all have to ask ourselves is like, what is the alternative? Are we gonna stay there for another 20 years? If we do, what are we going to do differently? What is the res how is the result going to be different? Yeah. Um, as, as far as some of the people like egging it on, um, like, hey, we need to stay there. Uh, that's, you know, like, like you're like maybe referencing like some of these people down in D.C. who work at like various think tanks and mm -hmm. things like that. And they say, like, you know, America is paying a very small price, a small, reasonable price to maintain our presence in Afghanistan. And if you go and talk to the widows or the kids uh, who have lost their dads over there, this price is not so small or so reasonable. And it's hard to discern what the pragmatic policy gain or um, tangible result is for America. Like, how is this a win for the United States mm -hmm. um, by just having soldiers there marking time? Yeah. What, 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 what are we doing there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, 10 years ago, I was like, you know what, man, we, we have to stay in Afghanistan for a while. This is a generational thing. We have to like to make a change. You can't go for a year or two. And now everyone's like, hey, man, democracy is great. We should Coca-Cola. Let's do this. You know, like that's not the way it works. Like there's people that have been taught. I mean, it's just uh, such an archaic place. You know, there's people that are in, in doing things that their people, their tribe has been doing for hundreds of years, if not more. And to, to try to go in and change some of these attitudes towards like tribal rivalries and different things like that is you have to look at the long-term thing. And that's what I, before I was like, Hey, we're going to have to be here for a long time. If we want real results, we're going to have to be here a long time and, and show these people why this is better. But it was such a mismanaged thing because of changing of administrations, changing of commands, you know, instead of 20 years of war, we've had like 21 year wars where, like you said, someone comes in new and like, this is what we're going to do now, you know, and, and makes a new change or tries to do something different, but it's all like ineffective. And, and when you see the, um, the a crazy amount of corruption that's within the military and how much money's being spent and how much I, I, I don't know if it was maybe your podcast or I was listening to something the other day and somebody was, it might've been BK on his news podcast was talking about one of the um, Afghans was saying like when they get it like 5,000 gallons of fuel, they expect like half of that to be siphoned off and sold on the black market and stuff like that, you know, just crazy stuff like that. And it's, we thought, you know, wrongly, I think that the people would see like, oh, hey, this is a better way to do things. Let's stand up against these the Taliban forces or these insurgents from other countries. And it just never kind of came to fruition. Yeah. And, you know, I think that if if we were to be upfront and say, hey, look, we're going to have to stay in Afghanistan for 50 years. Like this is a long term project. It, it's a generational conflict that we are going to have a, a sort of Marshall plan for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And we're just mm -hmm. gonna radically transform this country over a long period of time. 
to try to improve people's lives there, um, make sure that this never becomes a terrorist safe haven ever again. Um, maybe it's going to be a light footprint. It's going to be soft soldiers, special ops guys, not a huge investment. But hey, this is a this is a 50 year plan. We're going to deploy you for one year. And your your job is just to move the needle a little bit. And then the next guy comes in, he's going to push it a little bit. Instead, we had just as you said, we fought the same war 20 different times over the course of 20 years. Um, and each commander came in and thinking, you know, he was going to turn the corner in six months. Um, that obviously didn't happen. And again, as you mentioned also, maybe even if we were to go in there for 50 years, that the end result is that this is a foreign imposition on the Afghan people that mm -hmm. they are just mm -hmm. never going to accept, that they're just never going to accept Americans or any other nationality coming in there and trying to tell them how to live their lives. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird place, man. And it was it, what was interesting for me, too, is I remember one time we were out um, we we're out on a mission or something and we heard some gunfire and there was like a firefight going on. And but it wasn't with any Americans. We're like, what the hell's going on? What's going on? And we found out it was the foreign dudes coming in and telling like the local Taliban dudes like, hey, we're taking over this house. We're going to be here for a couple months. You know, this is what we're going to do. And the local dudes were getting pissed about all these foreign guys coming in. And they would get into their own fights and stuff like that. So it was like, there's so much going on in Afghanistan. The location of it is just horrible, you know, for trying to get people to be peaceful. The the logistics of trying to supply the country is just out of control. Just out of control. I mean, I don't know. It's um, I'm okay with it. Like a lot of people say they're, they're upset with us leaving and stuff like that. I, I think, like you said, it's time. You know, how many, we, we say, hey, we shouldn't leave because we lost dudes over there. But how many more dudes are we going to lose to continue that? that tradition, I guess, of going over there. And I mean, what, at this point, what are we doing? I feel like almost it's becoming a training ground for our special operations guys and stuff, you know, just to keep them on the cutting edge of like testing out new technologies and stuff. Like they're just, I don't know, cutting their teeth in Afghanistan, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird situation for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just want to get your kind of take on it because I think every Afghan vet should tell people what they think, you know, no matter if it's one way or the other, kind of express your feelings on it. You know, don't keep that shit in because people need to know. You're the one that went over there, you know, put your opinion out sure. there and let people know how you feel about it. It's uh, that's that's just how it should be. But I think it's time to definitely wrap that mission up and and, you know, get as many people out of there and let them do their thing. I saw an article the other day or just yesterday about how they think they're, the Taliban's going to take over all of our equipment. It's like, no shit. What do you think was going to happen if we leave a bunch of MRAPs and stuff behind? You think you're just going to be like, well, we're not going to use those. They may come back. You know, I, I felt like shit uh, five years ago, six years ago, when I watched ISIS uh, sweep through the areas of Iraq that, you know, mm -hmm. me and he made fought for. And it really drove home the point that all of that, everything I did over there was really for nothing. Um, watching the way the Yazidis were massacred how quickly those cities just fell yeah. and became yeah. a slaughterhouse for ISIS. It, it really drove home, yeah, how worthless it all was in the end. And I'm sure there are tons of Afghan veterans, uh, U.S. military veterans, watching district after district in Afghanistan fall to the Taliban right now. And they're probably feeling the exact same way. Yeah. And uh, Good. that's something that, that well, that's that's just something that all of us are going to have to struggle with. Yeah, I mean, I remember after coming back, and I would think I was home for two or three years. I don't remember. And the Tal I was in Sangin, you know, infamous Sangin district. And um, a couple of years after we got back, I think it was when ISIS was coming into Afghanistan as well. They just completely destroyed the bazaar. And there was a video online that showed like the whole area where we used to go through, you know, daily when we go out on missions and stuff like that. And the bazaar was full of people and you could smell the bread cooking. You could see the chickens hanging, you know, and all the weird things that happen in the bazaar and stuff like that. And then this video is like some kind of old West abandoned town, you know, with a tumbleweed blowing across the road. It's just, it's sad to see it, but it's like, dude, at some point, those people also have to fucking care for themselves. Like if they, they don't want that lifestyle, then they also have to stand up, you know, and do the, the right thing for their country. So it's tough, man. It's tough. And and the thing with ISIS, I would say the one good thing is, is the little, the little bit of support that we did give. I mean, we gave a decent amount of support in Syria and Iraq to fight back against ISIS and stuff like that. But I, I was kind of impressed with how well the Iraqis did 
you know, on their own trying to fight back once the initial like wave of them getting like crushed, you know, I don't know what your take on it is, but I thought they did. A lot of those cities would not have been taken back had the Iraqi forces not come back and fought through these dudes and some of the, and you can speak more to it. Cause you've actually been to like Syria and dealt yeah. with all this stuff. It's, it's a, it's a subject that I'm definitely not as well read on as you are. And, and I think a lot of people spout an opinion about that are probably not as well read as you know, they should be. Well, I mean, I guess one thing we can say for armies, you know, special forces, special op, uh, is the units in Afghanistan and Iraq that our guys trained, that soft guys trained, are really the only units over there that are worth a fuck. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones, they're, they're the ones fighting the Taliban today. They're the ones that fought ISIS. Um, for sure. So. So, I, I mean, in that sense, yeah, it's not a total wash. I mean, there there, there, there are some, some success stories. Yeah, I mean, you got to start somewhere, you know, and that was something we tried to tell guys, and I've mentioned on the podcast a few times, like when we went to Afghanistan, it's like we can't expect these Afghan soldiers to be at the same kind of level we are. You know, we're working off 200 years of refining our TTPs and, and training and, you know, supply chains and stuff like that, and these guys are starting from almost sure. nothing. And so it was like something you had to take in consideration. So I think we brought them up, but just, just not enough. And a lot of those dudes just didn't give a fuck. They were there to collect a paycheck. You know, I didn't work with the, the special operations guys. The Marsoc guys up the road would be working with those dudes, but the regular dudes, there were some fighters there. There were some dudes there that were patriotic and wanted to see better, you know, see their country improve and better living situation for their entire families. And there were some dudes that were just there to pick at their toes and collect a paycheck. You know, they weren't ready to do anything. You know, it is what it is. And I'm sure you, so we never really talked about it, but you went to Iraq with uh, your special forces, your ODA as a, an advisor. What was that like for you? Like, what was your take on, on those soldiers and stuff and, and how they, did you see them grow over your deployment? Um, I, I, it's a good question. I mean, we definitely worked with them hard and we trained them hard. Um, my experience was that we had two SWAT, uh, two platoons. It was uh, the SWAT team out of Telafar or Telafar, and we inherited them from previous ODAs that had run their selection course and trained them up. So we, we kind of came in at a good place. Mm -hmm. um, we had been set up for success by some of the previous teams. Um, one platoon, shit hot, really good guys. The other platoon, horrible. Just could not trust them with anything at all. You had to, you had to like watch them with an eagle eye. Yeah. Um, definitely the entire unit, um, could be matured and advanced over time. Um, the problem, as you mentioned, was, um, corruption. Uh, their, their, uh, their commander who the company commander, who I barely saw my entire time there, he was corrupt, complete worthless piece of shit. Um, and as motivated as, and as good as some of those guys were, if you're being sent on missions by the Iraqi government and they're not providing you with food, water, ammunition, how, how long are they going to fight? Mm -hmm. Um, so there was as much as we tried to push them along, push them in the right direction. You also have this command structure coming down from Mosul, from the government of Iraq that is just hopelessly inept and hopelessly corrupt. Um, because again, I mean, it, when ISIS came to town, I can't even really fault them for abandoning it at a certain point because I know that they were not receiving any sort of logistical support. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll be a miracle if they were even receiving their paychecks by that, um, after we left. Yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, man, it's a, it's a shitty situation. And as an, as you know, you also see in an instance like that, your limitation as a green beret, right? I'm just a 18 Bravo on the ground. Mm -hmm. I can do some pretty amazing things, but these guys are still tethered to the American logistical system. Um, even at that point, I was supposed to be weaning them off it, which we tried to do and getting them to rely on the, on the GOI, um, chain of command. Um, and, and GOI didn't step up. So the, the, that's the limitations of special forces, right? We, we can't work miracles. If, if the government doesn't want to do anything, then they're not. Yeah. And the problem with when you have corruption that goes all the way up the chain is there's no one to tell. You know, it's like, 
who am I gonna who am I gonna go to and be like this captain's corrupt? They're gonna be like, yeah, no shit. So is the guy above him, and so is the next guy. You know, they're all receiving those kickbacks and stuff. It's uh. It- it's interesting you say that because we did try to iron some of those things out mm-hmm. because it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you're not getting paid. Oh, you're not getting fuel. You're not getting. Bo- OK, let's see who's next in your chain of command. So it became a huge nut roll where we were actually trying to figure out who was in charge of our SWAT team. Like, yeah, they have a company commander, but who comes after that? And so, like, we were having different meetings with, like, different battalion commanders around Tel Afar and even over in Missoula to try to understand, like, Who's in charge of you? And the SWAT team guys are like, see, the problem is we don't even have anyone to go to to ask for these things. Like, they don't have a chain of command. So we're trying to establish their own damn chain of command in the Iraqi system. And none of the Iraqis want to take ownership of this unit because it's a it's a headache, right? It's mm-hmm. a headache because this is the unit that works with U.S. Special Forces, and we go and roll up bad guys. Like, nobody wants an al-Qaeda suicide bomber showing up at their front doorstep because they're in charge of this unit. For sure. So, um, yeah, so we were going through that whole process. I I mean, I remember one guy we went and met with to try to iron some of this shit out. And he would literally, I'm not joking, every 30 seconds, his phone would ring. His cell phone would ring. He'd have to pick up the phone. And then he'd call out to his secretary. The secretary would come in, give his little, like, uh, like old school British, like, stomp the floor, like, salute kind of deal. And they'd babble back and forth about something, then he'd leave. And so, and then we'd continue the conversation, be like, so, uh, Mr. Habib, uh, what we're trying to ascertain here is, and then his phone would ring and go through the whole process. Like, we ended up turning uh, the jammers on on the Humvees, the IED jammers, <laughs> nice. try to jam his cell phone, just so we could have like a five minute conversation because this guy so profoundly did not want to talk to us. It's crazy how little buy-in some people have in the future of their own country. You know, it's like, like we care. Like those of us that are deployed over there, a lot of us care. We want, we're here to help you out, man. We want to make this a better situation for you, but you got to care a little bit too. You know, like we expect you get, and it's, it's just kind of mind blowing when you're like, dude, the alternative to us here helping you and doing, you know, trying to help you and do good things is, some dude who's probably going to fucking kill you because you were even talking to us originally, you know, like, I don't know, man, it's, it's not really, it seems like it doesn't seem like a hard decision for me, but for some people it is, I guess, but it's, it's, it's both things, man, because like we didn't have a a very strong understanding of the cultural dynamic, political dynamics, but at the same time, they also would not man up and, and take charge. Um, and maybe they didn't want to. And maybe that's just the reality. This is what you have to work with. That is the reality for sure. That is. Yeah, man. So I'd like to, you know, we'll go ahead and start wrapping up a little bit. But I do want to give you, you know, you you left the Army, went to Columbia, studied political science, and um, became this investigative journalist going around doing stories for all kinds of publications. You know, I've seen your writing in, in all kinds of publications, stuff like that. You know, like I said at the beginning, you've authored multiple books, including your memoir, you're you're on multiple podcasts now right i know you're off your original one you have the team house now and then aren't you also working with one through stars and stripes or one of those other uh yeah military matters for stars and stripes that's awesome man so do you want to kind of give us a a run through of what you're up to nowadays yeah sure i mean Nowadays, uh, yeah, as you said, I work as a investigative journalist or write for a couple different places. Um, Connecting Vets is uh, connectingvets.com is one place that I write for regularly. Do some freelance work for Yahoo. I do the podcast for Stars and Stride. And then I do my own podcast uh, right here in this studio with another former ranger with uh, Dave Park, uh, the team house. And we interview a lot of soft and intelligence community veterans um, every Friday at 8 p.m., we do it live it's a live stream um so yeah all that stuff keeps me pretty busy yeah i bet man it's the life of a writer right i mean that's from everyone i've talked to i i just finished up school you know uh, at san diego state university in the journalism and advertising program i tried to do a little bit of both so i could have multiple job opportunities when i got out because i'm like the job market's crazy but you talk to anyone that's a journalist and it's like bro you better get ready to just sit down in front of your computer and start you know researching and writing researching and writing constantly and you have to be on top of it it's definitely a uh, a self uh it's all about your your own self-motivation to get a job like that done yeah i mean i can't 
tell you in in the past, you know, working as an editor, how many um, other veterans that I tried to give a job and I I schooled them up and got them right up to that line where it's like, okay, you have all the information you need uh, to do this job. Now you just need to do the job. You need to sit down and start writing. Mm -hmm. And I'd say nine out of 10 of them never wrote a thing. Really? Um, it's, it's just not something that most people are able to do. Um, and again, that, that was also maybe misguided on my part because I was, I was trying to find people who had experiences and then get them to put it down and write about them or, or conduct works of journalism and try to try to guide them down that road. And, um, not, yeah, not everyone can do that. Um, and that's just the reality of it. Yeah, for sure. And I really appreciate your coverage of, you know, different military topics and stuff like that. It's much better to read a story about the military from somebody that served in the military than it is for somebody that doesn't even know what it's like to, you know, try to sure. convey, you know, what they're, whatever the topic is. And um, I think it gives people a different perspective of, you know, when we talk about Afghanistan and stuff like that, you know, we all have these different feelings and perspectives from it. And I think it's, a, it's important for guys to get that out there. Um, I did want to mention, you know, being a journalist, you know, you don't have to go to college to become a journalist. You just have to start writing and stuff like that. Why did you decide to go to school? And you majored in political science, obviously, but why did you decide to go ahead and go to school before you, you know, fully went into your journalism career? Uh, well, I came out of the army and, uh, it, it was, I, I don't know, I, I guess that, that combination of hubris and ambition that most special ops guys have, right. Is, uh, I wanted to go to the best college I could possibly get into. So, you know, I applied to Columbia and I got in and, and went to school and I, and I had the GI bill of course and everything else. So, um, I, I definitely recommend people take advantage of that if they have it. Um, Political science was, I started off actually as a history uh, major. It, yeah. And uh, and then went with political science. And I mean, I think that in retrospect, looking back on it, I mean, having that degree has helped me um, with my work. Uh, and I think it, it's the similarity between, you know, studying political science and journalism is that you're trying to understand how things work, mm -hmm. right? You're trying mm -hmm. to pick things apart, put them back together, understand the relationship between institutions and individuals. Um, so it, it definitely benefited me. Although, as you say, I mean, it's not like I get paid more money as a journalist because I have this, you know, full degree in political science. I don't think anyone really cares. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, I think you did it the right way because, you know, as you, as you have on like your website and stuff, you started writing while you were in college. And mm -hmm. I think an, a, a lot of veterans may not consider that like, you leverage the GI bill. You're getting paid to go to school. That's the time that you can try these little projects. Like, Hey, maybe I'm good at doing this. Maybe I want to try this little side gig. This will, that's like your little buffer getting that BAH check and stuff to help you like maybe grow something like you guys did, you know? And, um, I just want to, I just wanted to put that out there because I think, like you said, I think it's very important that guys take advantage of the GI bill, you know, guys and girls, I, I say guys, but guys and girls, uh, take advantage of the GI bill and understand that, there's so many people that would love to have that benefit. And a lot of guys, I think I saw a statistic. It was like 85% of the people don't even use it. And I think a lot of people have the misconception that you have to go to like a Columbia or a San Diego state university or something like that. Whereas in reality, you can go to like a trade school like a trade. or you can go to a community college and learn a skill that may help you in the job that you're currently doing. And um, yeah, I just thought that was important to get across again, Jack, I want to appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, everyone can check your podcast out. You said Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern, correct? Is the live stream? Uh, 8, 8 p.m. Eastern. 8 p.m. I'm on the Pacific. I'm stuck on, you know, Pacific time out here. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I, I hope, uh, again, thanks for coming on the podcast. Everyone should check you out. I'm going to have all your social media handles and stuff up on the screen. Uh, if you want to go ahead and pass whichever ones you have for the audio listeners. Uh, oh, geez. So, uh, <laughs> You can find me on uh, Twitter at Jack Murphy RGR. Um, I have a, a personal website if you're interested in poking around on there, jackmurphywrites.com. And uh, then you'd find the team house on uh, wherever you look for podcasts, really, it's across most platforms. Um, and it's also the videos are on uh, YouTube. So if you just look for the team house, you'll find us. That's awesome. And everyone, uh, as always, my uh, Instagram is at former action guys at J Kramer graphics. And you can check out my website, jkramergraphics.com. Support the show, leave a review, do all those good things and uh, make sure to give me and Jack both a follow.
All right, man. All right. All right. Thank you so much, man. That's great.